Hi and welcome to Malicious Life in collaboration with Cyberism. I'm Ren Levy. Just a few days ago, news broke of one of the biggest and most significant cybersecurity incidents in recent history. A breach into several federal organizations' networks, at least one security firm, FireEye, and potentially up to 18,000 businesses in the U.S., including many Fortune 500 companies. The attack is currently informally attributed to APT29, a.k.a. Cozy Bear, a Russian state-sponsored hacking team. This is obviously big news, and so we decided to invite Israel Barak, Cyber Reasons CISO, to discuss this incident in detail. Some of you might remember Israel from previous episodes of Malicious Life, including our last live event from a few months ago. For those who don't, let me introduce you properly. Israel Barak, Cyber Reasons CISO, is a cyber defense and warfare expert with extensive background working for the government, where he established and operated various cyber warfare teams. Israel spent years training, guiding, and professionally mentoring new personnel, providing in-depth cyber expertise as it relates to cyber warfare, cybersecurity, and threat actors' tactics and procedures. Israel is also a regular speaker at leading cybersecurity industry conferences and events. Israel, thank you very much for joining us in such a short notice. Thank you, Ron. It's a pleasure to join you again, as always. So, for starters, take us through the events uh, chronologically as they unfolded. It started with FireEye, right? It did, but but actually, you know, the timeline actually started even before then. I think when you look at the events chronologically as they unfolded, today we know that the operational preparation on the attacker side and, and specifically setting up some of the command and control infrastructure began um, as, as at least as early as August 6, 2019, when some of the command and control domains were registered and the first known versions of the SolarWind uh, software modification was actually from October 26 of 2019. So as, 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 as far as, as August of 2019, when they begin that preparation. So, so based on what we know today, that operational infrastructure for this attack was actually built between August 19 and February of 2020. When I tell people about Family Sounds, the audio documentaries we create for families who wish to preserve an important piece of family history, a lot of them ask me if those family histories are really interesting to listen to. After all, we're talking about our parents and grandparents, not some famous movie stars or scientists. And my answer is always the same. You'd be amazed at the stories we get from these people. War stories, business stories, love stories. Almost everyone, especially if they had long and fruitful lives, have wonderful stories to tell. We want to be the ones to take your family's personal stories and turn them into wonderful documentaries. Trust me, your family's future generations will thank you for that. Visit familysounds.co and learn more about what we do and how we do it. Family Sounds, a gift from our time to our future. familysounds.co When is the first time we learn anything about it? So the attackers actually began to distribute that malware, right? Using that SolarWinds Orion software update process in March of 2020. And they did that for at least seven months until September of 2020. And according to some reports, actually perhaps even until November of 2020, they continued distributing that malware through the SolarWinds Orion software update process. Now, on December 6 of 2020, FireEye disclosed that a breach into their own network had occurred that impacted their uh, red team tools. Now, at the time, that report did not include any explicit reference to SolarWinds. It actually raised quite a, yeah, I would say, quite a bit of questions like, you know, why would a sophisticated adversary want to break into a network to steal commercially available software tools and, and know-how 
which was the, 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 the FireEye red teaming tools. And we didn't have to wait long, I think, until the bigger picture started to unfold. Now, on, on December 13th of 2020, a week after the initial FireEye breach report, um, Chris Bing from uh, Reuters broke the story that the U.S. Treasury Department had been compromised by a sophisticated adversary. And on the same day, December 13th, FireEye disclosed a second report, and this time it was the SolarWinds report that tied SolarWinds into the breach that FireEye had into their network. Shortly after, um, Alan Nakashima from the uh, Washington Post confirmed with background sources a couple of things. And number one, that the Treasury Department breach was perpetrated by the same group that targeted FireEye. Number two, that SolarWinds was involved in both breaches. And number three was that the threat group was believed to be um, APT29 or otherwise known as, as, as Cozy Bear or the Russian SVR. Now, also on December 13th of 2020, uh, DHS and CISA um, issued an emergency directive to U.S. government agencies to mitigate the compromise of SolarWinds Orion network uh, management products. And and two days later, on December 15th, a partnership of, of different organizations started taking down the known command and control infrastructure of Sunburst which is the uh, primary backdoor that was used in the attack. Now, now, lastly, I would say that I think it's important to mention that this attack is, is not over. Right? And we're still in, in an evolving situation. And, and I think we will know more over time, uh, for example, uh, what additional post-breach techniques were used by the attacker. Um, or in other words, what were they doing inside those breach networks? I uh, will probably know more about more accurate attribution, right, of who's behind this and, and, and whether other other actors. Yeah, Trump famously said that it might be the Chinese, but <laughs> he's the only one who claims that. Yes, but but I think I think it's the operation itself, as 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 you mentioned, with the number of targets and the breadth and depth of this operation, as you can imagine, is a, is a very very complicated operation to operate over time. And and we might learn that other threat actors were were playing one part or another in that as well. Um, I think we'll probably also learn more about the ripple effect of this massive attack, exactly who was targeted among these 18,000 potentially that downloaded that malware, uh, who was impacted and how. So it's an evolving situation. Yeah, that needs explanation. And we, we you already mentioned a few times the name SolarWind. Uh, and uh, I think that's the key part in understanding how could one single attack cripple or potentially cripple or breach so many organizations and departments in the U.S. government, etc. So what's SolarWinds and how does it uh, relate to this attack? So SolarWinds is a software company that primarily deals with uh, systems and management tools that are used by IT professionals. And, and perhaps the most widely deployed uh, SolarWinds product is, is Orion, which is a network management system, or short NMS. Now, the Orion NMS has broad capabilities for monitoring and managing systems at data centers, servers, workstations, and network devices, et cetera, et cetera. Now, not every organization will have SolarWinds configured identically, but when they do have SolarWinds Orion configured with these monitoring and management capabilities, it can be a very effective uh, targeting point for attackers to go after. And and one of the reasons for this is that in order for this system to monitor and manage the network, Orion needs to have a very wide and often very privileged access across the network, Um, SNMP, WMI, sometimes with agent installation on on managed systems. And, And so that broad access makes an NMS system a very lucrative target for attackers. So I think the fact that attackers targeted an NMS system is is, is certainly not surprising. And, and by the way, this is a scenario that we also encounter often in, in red team or adversary emulation exercises. Uh, but, but when you target an, an NMS system that gives you that broad access to the network. Now, when we think about the number 
of organizations that were impacted, we need to ask ourselves, who uses solar winds? And I think, I think better yet, we probably need to ask ourselves, who doesn't use solar winds? Uh, solar winds is one of the most prevalent network management systems out there. Over 300,000 customers. And, and among them, I think you'll see some of the largest brands, uh, over 80% of the Fortune 500 companies, for example, uh, federal government agencies. And I think that gives us a good idea of how far and how deeply the attackers may have gotten through this attack. Amazing. Now, people have been referring to this hack as a supply chain attack. What is supply chain attack? So uh, a supply chain uh, cyber attack is, is a type of cyber attack that seeks to damage an organization by, by targeting less secure elements in the supply chain. Or if you think about it in, uh, in ancient times, a technique that was used to target a fortified enemy would be to poison their water supply which I think is a good example of a supply chain attack, right? And in a supply chain attack, it basically enables an attacker to gain that trusted access into organizations by hiding itself in a legitimate tool that the organization is receiving from a trusted third-party supplier. And I think as organizations become better in doing their cyber hygiene, I think supply chain attacks remain a very effective uh, vector to gain that trusted access in a way that can be very, very difficult to detect. Now, second, this another advantage is, is that it can grant the attacker access into a very large set of targets like we're seeing with, uh, with, with uh, solar winds uh, with one effort, right? So, you know, in, in this case, it potentially accessing the entire customer base, right, of the compromised supplier. Now, the challenge is, with that type of operation are, uh, you know, oftentimes operational security. Since multiple organizations can be impacted by that attack and it can be very widespread, you need to be fairly sophisticated in your operation to make sure that it doesn't get exposed fairly quickly because of the sheer volume that you're distributing that attack to. Right. Mm -hmm. What that often translates to is a required level of sophistication on the threat actor side in terms of how to manage operational security during a very large scale operation. How prevalent are these supply chain attacks, you know, in general? Uh, are they used often against enterprises? So supply chain uh, cyber attacks are, are not new, right? We've been seeing between two and three, I would say, more significant supply chain attacks uh, each year in the past several years. And we, we all probably remember the, uh, the NotPetya attack from several years ago in which uh, uh, a Russian uh, threat actor was able to cause massive disruption to a large number of organizations using a supply chain attack that included uh, spreading a malicious uh, software update from a Ukrainian software provider. Uh, but I think the attack on and, and through SolarWinds is, is likely the widest and very likely the most far-reaching supply chain cyber attack that we've seen to date. Is there anything that a company like, I mean, so many companies and organizations that use SolarWinds, um, could they have done anything basically I mean what kind of um, influence do you does an organization have on an organization like solar winds or is there anything else that a client can do to protect itself from such a supply chain attack so I think I think tactically speaking there are several things organizations could have done to protect themselves against this this specific attack at first, the security of the NMS system is probably something security teams need to spend more time thinking about. In, in many organizations, and I dare say in most organizations, the IT operations team is deploying and, and configuring the NMS system, often without much involvement or, or, or guidance from the security team. And this is, this is probably a tactical lesson that we have here. Um, and by the way, I think this also applies to security orchestration and automation or SOAR platforms that many organizations have been deploying that have far-reaching access and privileges that may need to be reviewed with additional scrutiny now. But let me press you stronger on, on mm -hmm. this point. 
I mean, what if I was, for example, an IT manager in such an organization, what, what can I know about a third-party product such as SolarWinds Orion platform that would enable me to make such a decision or protect myself? Isn't it like you know, a black box that I'm buying and deploying on my platform? And you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I think I think it that's part of what makes detecting that type of attack and protecting against that type of attack so so difficult, right? It is that level of trust and the built-in limitation in how much you can validate, right? The uh, the the level of security and integrity of a third-party product that you're consuming and putting in your network, which is why. I think oftentimes when you talk about threat modeling of how we manage risk in these type of environments, the question becomes, how do we reduce the potential impact of a supply chain attack, right? How do we make sure that we can contain it, right? If it does happen, mm -hmm. how do we give it the least amount of privileges? In most organizations, NMS systems are configured with way over provision privileges. They can do a lot more than mm -hmm. what they can actually, they actually need to do. And so reducing privileges, containing their ability to access network assets that they don't need to access, uh, segregation, uh, blocking their ability to access external networks, right? Or to communicate with the internet if they don't need to. And if they do need to, then limiting the specific or restricting the specific addresses that they could communicate with outside to only those that are needed. So I think when, when we talk about threat modeling of NMS systems, it's often a about the over-provisioning of capabilities that we see in most organizations that I think can lead to a very high impact of a supply chain attack like that. You know, I think also people are now thinking about how have we gotten to the point where one software system, Orion's update, SolarWinds system, is deployed in so many organizations and so many important organizations that by itself i think is a problem it's it's kind of, kind of like a single point of failure for so many companies isn't it well i think i think the, the at the end of the day what you'll see is that uh products that are uh valuable high quality and solve real problems proliferate through the market. And, and you're right, solar, solar winds is, um, how shall I call it? It's the solar winds is for um, NMS systems uh, like Kleenex is for tissues. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a very, very prevalent brand. Yeah, and that could be also one major lesson from this incident when people decide on uh, buying, purchasing a uh, system, software, platform, whatever, perhaps there's value in not following the mainstream uh, decisions of the market. Uh, for example, it's a kind of reminds me of the, the problem with Windows platforms as being, uh, you know, target of so many uh, hackers and viruses and such, while Linux distributions because they are less prevalent in the market, mm -hmm. uh, have much less uh, target. They are much less targeted. Uh, diversification is probably one uh, thing that you need to also consider when purchasing something, right? I fully agree. And I think when you look at... Um more mature security organizations and, uh, and, and more sophisticated security buyers, diversification of, of security products specifically is something that is built into their culture. Uh, for example, they would not buy all their firewalls from the same vendor, right? Mm -hmm. They will not buy all their VPN systems from the same vendor because they assume that any single vendor can be compromised and a supply chain attack can trickle down and impact their own networks. And so they want to make sure that they're building layers that can help them reduce the impact of that type of incident. Uh, kind of reminds me of uh, one of uh, the most probably basic principles in nature overall, that if the organisms in the community are homogeneous, they are more uh, at risk of being attacked by one a uh, predator or a virus or whatever. So uh, in nature, organisms have kind of evolved 
to be heterogeneous. Uh, even, you know, sexual reproduction is kind of the same. It's nature's answer to these kinds of threats. So we need to take maybe a lesson here. So Israel, what do we know about the sunburst malware so far from the preliminary analysis that people are already doing? So I think we know uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, we already know that the malware was deployed as part of a software update from SolarWinds' uh, own servers and was digitally signed by a valid digital certificate with their name. And that really strongly points to a supply chain attack. Now, SolarWinds, because they're a publicly traded company, published uh, some limited information through the um, uh, SEC uh, that they believe the attacker did not directly compromise their code base, but rather compromised their build environment, which is where the code gets turned into packaged software that can be delivered to consumers. Um, I think we can also see the sophistication of the attacker here, both on the development side and on the operational side. On the development side, uh, the techniques used as part of the development of the tool set, I think include several very effective anti-analysis countermeasures that are specifically effective in a supply chain attack. Uh, the first one was uh, delayed execution. Essentially, the, the backdoor checks that the product update has been deployed for between 12 and 14 days before it tries to beacon or communicate with its command and control. The reason it's effective is because it is able to bypass the victim's ability to secure their change management process, right? A lot of organizations first deploy an update into a staging environment, then they check that it's acting normal, and then they roll this out into production. But no one's waiting for two weeks before they make those changes. You know, usually a product stays in, an, in a staging environment for a couple of hours, maybe a couple of days. But the fact that they waited for two weeks means that they wanted to explicitly bypass that change management process and basically preventing not just the change management process for or that pre-deployment testing process from identifying that, that abnormal change, but also for preventing the use of malware sandboxes and other in instrumented environments from seeing it. Uh, they also so include... Perhaps, uh, I mean, the clients themselves can't really, after two weeks, they can't really, really make the connection between a certain update to a third-party system to you know, such and such behavior they discover. It's not a... It's not a, an immediate connection, I'm guessing. Exactly. And, it, you know, you uh, a lot of these clients, I would imagine, right, a lot of these um, Orion users, even if they saw something happening, they very likely dis discarded it as, you know, this is just, you know, this is just a legitimate Orion behavior. Um, the attacker also included you know, some anti-sandboxing behaviors, right? So basically what they, what they wanted to make sure is they wanted to make sure that the machine that they're deployed in is connected to a relevant domain, right? And if it is not connected to a relevant domain, uh, the malware essentially will not execute, okay? They also made sure that certain domain names can be resolved to public IP addresses and not private IP addresses, which is a technique that they used to ev uh, evade sandboxing tools. A lot of sandboxing tools, when you put a piece of software in it, uh, in them, and, and you detonate it, they would reroute the traffic from you know so they can inspect it into into private IP addresses. So by checking that certain domains are resolved to public IP addresses, they're able to bypass these pre-deployment tests, right? And those are techniques that are very, very relevant, not just to uh, for anti-forensics, and uh, but they're also very, very relevant when you target specifically a supply chain attack. On the operational side, I think we can see the sophistication of the attacker and the way they set up and maintain separate sets of indicators of compromise for each target across a network of thousands and thousands of targets, right, to basically reduce that likelihood for detection of this attack and, and make it harder for victims to investigate it. I think another interesting angle from a technical perspective, also from a threat intelligence perspective, is, is that potential connection to the VMware. Uh, vulnerability. For our listeners, uh, the, NS uh, the NSA, I think, published an advisory 
regarding uh, regarding uh, vulnerability in, in VMware that was being actively exploited, as they termed it, by Russian state sponsored attackers. Right, and I think uh, I think uh, one of the interesting correlations there is that um, if you look at the context for that NSA advisory and the vulnerability information, it basically talks about a vulnerability in five VMware products. Uh, and according to the NSA advisory, it was identified as being actively exploited by several Russian uh, state-sponsored actors. Now. The vulnerability in the VMware product or exploitation of that vulnerability essentially allows attackers to deploy a web shell on a system and gain access to protected data. But this vulnerability is a post-breach vulnerability only. That means that it can only be exploited by someone who has already authenticated to the system and is already inside the network. And it is assumed today that this vulnerability was one of the tools in the tool belt of the SolarWinds uh, threat actor that was used post-breach after they were able to gain that initial access via that solar SolarWinds compromise so they can further expand their level of access and control over victims that use these vulnerable versions of VMware. And so I think, I think the the level of sophistication, the the amount of effort that was invested in 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 effectively operating uh, a very very large scale operation, maintaining operational security across hundreds and potentially thousands of different targets that are part of the same campaign and the same operation. It very much points to uh, an adversary. We often say the word sophisticated or advanced adversary, right? But I think this is. This is the poster child of an advanced <laughs> adversary and, and how they're able to operate in those scenarios. If you're a defender fighting cyber attackers, you must be successful every time. They only need to be successful once. Cyber Reason reverses the attacker's advantage. End cyber attacks from endpoints to everywhere. One more interesting question that uh, arises from this incident, uh, as you mentioned, Microsoft uh, last week took over a domain used uh, for command and control of the malware. It's called uh, the malware itself is called Sunburst, and it, there's a certain domain that the uh, code references and calls for uh, commands. Why should Microsoft be the one to? You know, take those kinds of steps. Aren't, aren't the FBI or some other, you know, uh, more formal organization, state organization that should be taking care of such things? So I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the areas of, of, of actual, I would say, one of the uh, one of the bright areas that we're seeing here, one of the uh, areas from optimisms that I'm actually seeing in, in this particular incident, the solar wind incident, is how it's not just it's not just one single vendor, but the entire community comes together to create a more efficient process. Right in in past times, uh, vendors would wait for a court order, right, for a regulator instruction to perform a certain action. Right today, I think the industry has matured enough for different players, right? And, and and very likely this isn't done by a single vendor in this space, but because one single vendor can have a limited effect, right? As big as they are, they can have a limited effect over a global uh, situation like this. It's about uh, the community coming together. It's about uh, organizations that are vendors, that are end users, that are uh, practitioners, that are regulators in the space coming together and acting in the most efficient way possible to try to end a situation, not waiting for bureaucratic steps, right? Not mm -hmm. waiting until they have to, but trying to do the right thing together. Uh, I can see your point, and efficiency is probably a very good advantage of this kind of uh, thinking. But then again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the feeling that I don't know if I want entities, commercial entities such as Microsoft, taking decisions like taking down domains because they think these domains should be shut down. 
on some level it kind of troubles me that um, we give commercial entities and you know like Microsoft such you know huge powers authority over our lives maybe I'm overreacting <laughs> no no I, I I think you're right but I also think you you mentioned and you framed it very accurately earlier by calling this a natural and natural evolution and natural selection process that That we're going through and in a natural selection process um, you don't always get to the happy medium right the best possible option immediately you go from one edge to another edge and you sort of fluctuate between those options until you converge into something or an option that is the best fit to its environment and I think we're going through a similar situation right in uh, in, in how we evolve as a security community. Right? We go from a state, a past state where we were slow to respond, acting as single entities as, 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 as opposed to a, a, a partnership. And we're going into we're fluctuating between these different states and eventually we're, we're, we're going to converge right into a stable state that's going to be the most efficient state possible considering a, a certain environment. <laughs> uh, yeah, very interesting to think about it. Beside, before we part ways, any uh, last lessons or thoughts that uh, you have in mind following this incident? Well, I think, uh, I think on, a, on, a, on the more strategic side, I, I think we need to, to become better at managing the risk from supply chain attacks because they, they will continue, right? We see how successful they are. We just saw how difficult it is to detect them and to actually take effective action right even though we now all know about solar winds this this incident is very much still ongoing and the attacker is still very much on top of what's going on here and so we can see how difficult it It is to, to, to detect and take this down and, and obviously we'll see more of this and so um, I think we need to ask ourselves a number of questions and, and specifically from a security perspective we need to ask ourselves how we can prevent detect and effectively respond to a supply chain attack and both after it's discovered and Like we're seeing now with the solar winds incident uh, but more importantly before it's discovered it's right? switching from a reactive position where we you know rely on finding these indicators of a known threat in our network right that reliance on IOCs as they're referred to which is often not relevant right for prevention uh, only for that you know post-mortem analysis I think we need to switch to using the a better behavior analytics and indicators of behavior to identify those subtle attacks through those change of chain uh, chains of behaviors that they're exhibiting in our environments so I think some examples for indicators of behavior from the solar winds incident is how they leverage domain generation algorithms to, to establish command and control communication how they ended up um, you know creating a situation where the solar winds application the legitimate application started doing execution and persistence activities on 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 those machines those Orion machines that were very admirable behaviors but a lot of organizations did not have the tools or the analytics to Or the mindset to see that these subtle changes are happening in their networks and associate them with malicious activity and so I think uh, I think we need to become better at identifying these more subtle behavioral signals and making sense of them through behavioral analytics I think at the same time we need to think about the data retention and on our EDR and other monitoring solutions for historical context for example in this incident we needed to have historical context that goes all the way back to March right for organizations to understand what the full impact of the incident is on them and so I think the bottom line is probably that the incident I believe calls for that additional impact security attention to threat modeling of supply chain attack vectors as well as innovation of a security stack with using indicators of behavior for detection of malicious activity via EDR and, and other monitoring solutions and I, and I think that proves proves to be a very effective proactive detection strategy against these supply chain as well as other subtle cyber attack tactics. Thank you very much, Israel. It's been a fascinating uh, conversation that took us from cybersecurity to natural selection and evolution and all the way back to <laughs> cybersecurity again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for having me, Ren. Oh my God. CK Music.